Eric McCormack is here. I am. How are you? Thank you. I'm awesome. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen. So we're going to start with a little clip. Okay. Seven months ago, my consciousness was sent from the distant future. I am Traveler 3468. One of thousands of travelers around the world who have come to save humanity. To change the path. So that's my guest, Eric McCormack, speaking as his character in the show Travelers, as you just heard, plays Traveler 3468, takes over the body of another human being, an FBI agent named Grant McLaren. I want to start by acting. So I'm not, I'm not an actor. I don't mm. know anything about acting. But I have to imagine that there's an added challenge here because you're not just playing a character. You're playing another character inside of another character. Right. And it's a challenge that uh, never goes away for the five leads on the show. We are forever infiltrating uh, this this time frame, but also these people. And uh, we come equipped, almost ill-equipped, because we have um, just a little information about them. We're from 500 years from now. And what we know about what we know about 2016 is all from social media. It's all from what we said about ourselves uh, and what we recorded on Facebook and on Instagram and um, in, the, in the recorded. So there, the, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, in our show, travel much earlier than, say, 2001, because there wasn't enough right. digital data to, uh, to set up the technology that allows for this, this travel. So we, I show up in the body of, uh, of an FBI agent who's married, and I have to take over his life. And when I'm not following assignments from the future to... Uh, and, and there are often assignments that we have no idea why we're doing them. We know they're part of a bigger puzzle to fix the dystopian nightmare that is 500 years from now. <clears throat> or the states right now, so um, we have to we have to just follow orders. But when we're not following orders, when we have no orders to follow, we're just living these people's lives, right. which is guesswork most of the time. Right. Uh, and most of what happens in in twenty uh, first century experience is not ours. We didn't see the sun because we were living in domes. Uh, we didn't eat meat. We didn't have pets. There was just so many aspects of of this life that we. Uh, don't take for granted. And so there's a kind of a hopeful quality to the show. It's not as dark as it can be. We, as, as the five leads, are discovering wonderful things every day, too. The, the, the challenge of that seems to be that, like, I, and again, as a non-actor, I'm at least aware that when you get a role, you try to understand the character that you're playing. Some people get their backstory. I, I find, I've, I've talked to people who write essays based on what this person would do. But you're essentially playing two characters in one. I mean, so how much of you is thinking about your host? How much of you is thinking about the person that you actually are? I think in this case, uh, I'm always thinking I, I like the person from the future. That is my yeah. job. That's who I am. But I must always wear this disguise. That's hard. It is hard, and it's and it's, but it's, um, it makes everything more layered. Uh, particularly in my case, my protocol five, as we call it, which is basically when you're not, when you have no instructions, live their life. Uh, I'm married to a woman that um, I have little information of, uh, other than what little my, my character uh, put on his Instagram in 2016. So every day is guesswork. I'm suddenly making love to her, and it's like from the moment in season one that we have sex for the first time, she knows something's up. This right. is, I mean, this is my husband, but he never did that before. So every step we make in the kitchen, in the bedroom, at, at the office, because I'm an FBI agent, could be the wrong step. It's where somebody goes, wait a minute. Yeah. But what I like, what I like about the way you do this is that it's it's very it, it's very subtle. Like I I spoke to Michael Caine a couple of weeks ago. Oh, nice. That's, I'm, I don't have a question based on. It. I just wanted to tell you. <laughs> um, no, I spoke to Michael Caine a couple of weeks ago, and he said that um, one of the early acting lessons he got was that he was acting like a drunk. So he was supposed to act like a drunk. So he was you know stumbling around and hiccuping. And the director said, no, 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 no. Like a drunk wouldn't act like right. that. You would act very subtle. So you, you would have to, people would only be able to barely discern. You'd be trying to keep it together. And I think that's the challenge that I see. That's what I find so appealing about this show. Right. You're always, I mean, I thought that about uh, Johnny Depp's first uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I thought what was interesting was watching a severe drunk try not to be drunk. And I think that's why that led to a, a nomination. But I, it's the same thing here. You're constantly trying to think of, you, you don't want to show your hand. It's the opposite. Even the audience doesn't want to see your hand. They want to know that you're you're struggling uh, in that moment. Um, and those are my favorite moments in the show. Has this made you renegotiate your relationship with social media at all? Seeing as how your your entire character's knowledge is based on what they shared willingly online? Well, it makes me 
re- realize that this this thing we're living in for the last two years, this fake news thing, is is a huge problem for how because we are now our own historians. Mm. Everyone is their own is responsible for their own life. Our diaries are online, and how many people are lying? How many people are, are, are sort of exaggerating their life? And how many people on social media don't put a picture and hide behind a, a made-up name so that they can say anything? Is their rage real or are they just glomming on? Because it's easy. It's easy to write something enraging or, or to choose a side when you don't have to. It was an amazing story that Sarah Silverman um, on online confronted a guy that yeah. had said something terrible about her. And with, she didn't confront him in a violent way, but in a, wow, you must be really hurting kind of way. And within a few weeks... He'd change sides. He'd become her friend. He'd become an advocate for things that he was only screaming about from his his basement. So I, I think that there's so much good that can be done in mm. social media. But right mm. now, it's it's sickening to see how it is used as as a as a weapon. I mean, it's interesting for you because you you live a public life. In that is to say, like you have the option of a public life. And and so many people I speak to who are like you know when mm-hmm. they go out, when you go downstairs, people will be calling out. When you walk down the street, people will be calling out. Hey, you owe me money. But the uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean. And I do. Yeah, you'll be you'll be you you have a public life. So, a lot of people like yourself have told me, why would anyone want that if they didn't need it if they didn't need it for their job why would anyone have an instagram account or a twitter account if they didn't need to have it for their job yeah i agree 100 percent, and i wouldn't uh it's it's very much a thing that i try to use um just to promote the work and otherwise live privately whereas say deborah messing my co-star and one will and grace i mean she has quite valiantly and uh and in a very well-spoken way used it as a tool um to to fight what's going on and i I retweet her a lot. I support it. I, yeah. But I'm also like, ugh, I don't want to be on the front lines every moment of every day. Sometimes I have to just back up and be my son's father mm. um, and be private. And yeah. it, it is a, it's a harder world every day for anybody to be private mm-hmm. when you've all of a sudden had a Facebook page for three years and you realize you've shared everything. And what, now you want some privacy? Mm-hmm. You've got, you've got f- followers or, or friends that you've never met before on Facebook. Everyone does. And it's like, why did I decide to do that? Yeah. Why did I decide to share so much of me with strangers? And that's something that the show brings up. I feel like if they if they if they came back in the future to you, they wouldn't they wouldn't know that much about you. Well <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Yeah, maybe I'm, so. I'm go- I'm about to go to my alma mater at Ryerson and talk to the students there, and I have a feeling they don't know much about me. It's, <laughs> it's been thirty three years. Well, they would know the person the public you, but you know, yeah. the true you. Um all Canadian show. Yeah, and I, I read a statement. I rarely read statements from actors on why that's important, but this is a priority for you. Well, it was uh, a luxury because I, quite frankly, um, I had to go t- south to get beyond what I, I could accomplish years ago. Like Twenty-five years ago, I had done a street legal and a uh, ENG, and then yeah. I couldn't get hired beyond it. Do you remember that and, moment of going, "I'm, I'm going to leave"? Well, it happened roundabout because I went to Vancouver first, and I worked on a lot of American shows in that in that '92, and then I went south. Um, but it was it was gradual because I, as I've often said, I dreamed locally when I uh, lived here. I I I wanted to work at the Tarragon Theater. You know, mm-hmm. I wanted to work at the CBC. Mm-hmm. Um, bad idea. Bad. <laughs> I, I was a I was an intern at Chum AM when I was oh. 15. I mean, this is I I my parents were Toronto born, and I, I love this city. But over time, something kind of pushed me elsewhere, so um, the dream evolved. But I do remember the moment of of landing in L.A. and saying, well, I, I, this is happening now. This I, I, I don't want to back off from this. Nobody wants to go home with their tail between their legs. So now you're able you, – you mentioned this is a luxury to be able to be back in Canada working in an all-Canadian – well, right now, yeah, it's a luxury to be back in this country. Um, right. But uh, the fact that travelers started – before the election, the travelers started out of a sincere desire to um, to work in Vancouver, where I, my wife and I live when we're not in L.A., and to work with Brad Wright, who's another Scarborough boy uh, who created the show. And and I said to him after we – when we first talked, he said uh, – I said, these are incredible parts, these other four travelers. You're, we're going to have to – I guess we're going to have to go to L.A. And he said, no, nope, I found them all. Found them all in Vancouver, and two two of them are from from Flin Flon, Manitoba. Jared Abrahamson. Jared Abramson, who's yeah. incredible, 
uh, Mackenzie Porter from Medicine Hat. Sister of Kaylin Porter, former Canadian uh-huh. Idol. Yeah. And she's got music coming out of her own like right. any day now. Mm-hmm. Um, Patrick Gilmore, also Flynn Flon, two Flynn Flon boys. And they're just all amazing. So I'm, I'm, it's not just that they're Canadian, it's that there's incredible talent here and we get to, to have it. It feels like the industry's changed then too. I mean, if you had to leave... In any two, because there weren't that many opportunities. Now yeah. it sounds like things have changed. I think there. Well, there's obviously just more more content, and there's there's more Canadian companies making it, and they're not necessarily making it just for Canada. I mean, I, it's one thing to say we're all Canadian. We're making travelers for the world. Yes, uh, and that's the luxury of Netflix. Is it's it drops everywhere on December fourteenth. There's not a country it doesn't drop in. So that's incredible. Whereas in the it, when it was a hard thing for let's say street legal to say we're a Canadian show and that's and that's all we ever need to be and they did it. You know, yeah. they changed how Canadians watched Canadian television, I think, and traders did the same thing and but it took time. It just wasn't it wasn't easy back then. I feel like there's a lot of sci-fi too. Like I mean there's like there's X-Files was, was shot in Canada, Battlestar Galactica was shot in Canada. Yep, both shot in Canada but not for Canada exactly and not saying, starring yeah. Canadians, you know. Yeah. So it, that's the luxury part of it is that we get to really just look at each other and go, "Hey, we're from here." Do you know what Jared Abramson's um, MMA fighter name is? <laughs> I should know that, but I don't. I, I interviewed him one time and it was a, it was a kind of, you know, we, I just thought I was talking to kind of an up and coming actor and then and in my research, we found that um, he was an MMA fighter. And I said, you were an MMA fighter? He goes, yeah, my name was Wolf Blood. Yeah. I, 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 after I left the mines, uh, <laughs> after I left the mines, I uh, started throwing punches around, you know, uh, and, and they pay for that. So. He's a tough cookie. He is a tough cookie. Yeah. He's an awesome actor. Yeah. He's an incredible really dude. Good. If you're just yeah. tuning in, I'm speaking with Eric McCormack, who's just about to launch season three of his sci-fi series, Travelers, on Netflix. And you can also catch him starring in Will and Grace. The revival is airing in its second season on TV right now. So there's like days between filming Travelers in Vancouver and Will and Grace in, in L.A. Is that hard on your sleep? Um, luckily, I haven't had to sort of go back and forth um, for the jobs. But there was only four this year, there was only four days between finishing uh, travelers and starting Will and Grace. Oh my so, God! Yeah, it was. Uh, How's that? Well, it's 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 a pretty quick journey from straight to gay uh, when you've only got four days. <laughs> but uh, you can find it. You know, they're both <laughs> they're both they're both such comfort zones for me. They're totally different. Um, but one, you know, Will is very much all of my energy all the time, and um, and Grant McLaren is. None of my energy. I'm a completely sort of tight, suppressed uh, film performance, and it's it's fun. I, it's something I can do now better than I uh, could when I was when I was younger. I, I want to go back to acting because you've talked in the past about how your training in theater allows you to make that transition a little bit easier between different shows, different characters. But how do you prepare yourself for the difference in being in front of a studio audience with Will and Grace, which I have to imagine is acting on a different impulse than it is uh, for travelers where there is no audience. Yeah, a sitcom is its own thing, at least one with that has a uh, a live audience, which I have to remind people that we do. We really do have an audience of 250 people every every episode. Um, but it's because you're tempted to play the crowd, but you can't because it won't be too big. Uh, so you're you're kind of giving a film performance. You're aware of where your camera is. Um, but at the same time, if it's too small, it's not funny for a crowd, and so it's 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 a balance. It's its own little uh, balancing act. Yeah, I never thought about that because it, it is like theater, but you have to. I guess you have to go against a lot of theater instincts too, to like to not play for the people in the room. Well, when you think about, um, I don't know, Kramer on Seinfeld, he he was obviously giving a theater performance, and he could, mm-hmm. uh, because that worked for that character. But some of the other people that we've loved um, on on sitcoms, even like say Ted Danson on Cheers. He wasn't talking loud, and sometimes he was just muttering under his breath behind the bar, and it was hilarious. But that's – you can find that range, just, but it takes time in any given show to find the right tone. Does it feel the same? Does it feel the same as it did when you first started working on Will & Grace, like the process, the, the work itself? Yeah, it's identical. That's what's so – I mean, it, I, I've said recently that I, I have two time travel shows. You know, one of them I've actually traveled back in time because we, we don't – the schedule, uh, Jim Burroughs has directed every single episode of the show. We have all our same department heads, um, our same writers. So it does feel like we're young again. The difference is we can appreciate it a bit more and we can tell stories about being in our 50s. When you say appreciate it a bit more, what do you mean? We used to do 22 a year and we did eight years. So by season seven, 
you ton of, you, you take things for granted. Um, yeah, it's natural. And, yeah, it's, it's totally natural. And you, by then you're also thinking, I got to create other things or I'll be Will for the rest of my life. So you're always looking outward. What's What movie will I do? What Who will hire me for something different? Shall I do theater? As opposed to just appreciating what every week is. And I really, show night on Will & Grace is one of my one of my favorite things. It's just a great celebration of that, hilarity. I mean, that's that's a real existential sort of... The thing, that, the, the thing that sticks out to me, what you said was, you know, at the end, like, I don't want to be Will for the rest of my life. And not to say that you will, huh? but... Uh, oh, my God, I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> that, was re- that was relatively unintentional. I'm checking them off. Yeah. You, got, you, got, you, got, you got one more. Yeah, yeah. Got thank you very much. <laughs> But it seems like you've made some peace there. Oh, a hundred percent. And and the peace is, uh, I mean, it just took time to work my way towards Travelers. And when, when it finally came along, I thought, great, now I get to be the dramatic actor that I was training to be all those mm-hmm. years ago and focus just on that. And yet to have Will and Grace come back is to, I wasn't crawling back to it because I couldn't do anything else. I'd done other series since and I'd done dramatic roles. So I was able to go back to the sitcom and wear it with with a different kind of pride, as opposed to having to be defensive and going, well, I I can do other things. Mm-hmm. Um, I was doing them. I had literally had just finished season one of of Travelers, and so t- both both solitudes um, are, uh, give me all of me. Have you? <laughs> they, they make up. They make up all of Eric McCormack. I um, have you given any thought to the things that arts journalists write about, which is what does Will and Grace's return and Charm's return and MacGyver's return and Murphy Brown's return say about where we are right now? Have you given any thought to the why of reboots? Well, I mean, ours was one of the first. And yeah. I, I, it came out of a kind of an organic place in that we sh- we only intended to get together for 10 minutes and make this video for Hillary Clinton, which we did. It was top secret. It dropped on the on YouTube. And that was, as far as I knew, the only life it was going to have. But I think Max Munchnik, who created the show, had other plans. I think he always thought of that as kind of a, uh, let's just see, let's see what sticks, kind of a proof of concept that this could go again, and and that's what happened. But as the others started to happen, I thought, is this a result of just people going, well, if that works, then this will work? Or is it, in the last two years, people people needing something comfortable because the news is so upsetting, that, that, that something that they can... You know, I, I'm like, I'm loving The Handmaid's Tale right now. I'm just finishing season two. But mm-hmm. my God, at the end of the day, my wife's like, I need something funny. Let's yeah. go watch something funny. Yeah. So I think there's a, it is definitely a comfort food thing, certainly with the comedies that are coming back. You think so, hey? That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think that, um, and everything is so new. There's 10,000 channels, and it's fantastic that there's so much content. But for the average person, people used to watch the same show. 49 million people would watch the same show on the same night at the same time and talk about it the next day. Yeah. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it's You can binge something to, tonight. I won't binge it. I, I may never see it. So there's a there's a, a familiarity and a comfort in, in people being able to go to work the next day and say, did you see Will and Grace? Yeah. And that's a, ver- that's a throwback. Does that change you as an actor? Like um, uh, Travelers is on Netflix, which means, again, uh, people are going to binge it all at once, or again, you said they, they may never see it. But also your performance will be taken in 12 episodes or, you know, six, seven episodes yeah. in a row as opposed to one a week. Does that change your acting at all? Does that change think, your work or I directing? It does. It absolutely changes the direction because um, Netflix is so um, – easy with, with us and with anyone they work with. They say, go ahead, make, make a great show. But they do want to make sure that this no episode really ends, that every episode is kind of a cliffhanger because they want the, you to keep watching. And that's how I do it now. I, I, I didn't ever think I'd be a binger. I don't generally have that much time at night in front of the TV. But if the show's right, I'm going to... I watched all of Killing Eve, I think, in one sitting. So good. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So it is the new way, and it does change... Um, like, for instance, Brad, uh, Brad Wright, uh, who created the show, came out of uh, network television. He's used to a certain style of writing that incorporates kind of a reminder in the first few scenes, a little bit of exposition that yeah, you don't need that anymore. I mean, you really don't need it. Mm. Uh, and and it's, it almost becomes redundant for people that are fast forwarding, for people that just want to get to the next episode. I'm binging. Don't tell me what I just saw. And so that is a, a kind of hungry... ADD style of, of watching that does have to inform what we do 
Uh, it takes balls to make a slow show, for instance, to, to really take your time, and and uh, and which I love, but it does take a kind of courage because everyone's terrified of losing their viewers. Right. I, I, I noticed it, Wayne. What's the What's the Gordon Ramsay show where he fixes the where he fixes the restaurants? Is that, Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen is that that one? I think, or maybe it's a different one. But that, yeah, one, that, I mean, one of those, right? Yeah. And I was, and I decided to watch it on Netflix. So I was, I was going through, and I just it was like the early seasons, and the entire like last minute of each block was coming up next on. It was like all yeah. about getting you past the commercial, and then the first minute of the past the commercial was revamping, and it was driving me, driving me crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, my wife always, oh, I want to see the, what's coming next week. Like, Why do you? We're going to watch it. <laughs> We've already decided we're going to watch it. I don't want to see that. So back in September, Eric McCormack, you were honored with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Indeed. Congratulations. Thank you. What's that like? Uh, it's surreal. Um, it's it's one of those things you don't really think of. I, 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 it's not practical to, to dream of that. Do they give you a call and let you know? How do you find that out? Yeah, you find out about a year in advance. Um, and it's a strange ceremony because one of them happens every other week. Uh and it's kind of what you make it. I think for, for a lot of people, it's a cynical thing. It's one more thing they get. You know, I don't know how much it mattered to Kid Rock that he got us. I don't know <laughs> that it ever crossed his mind. Whereas for me, it was a chance. I, I came to the States not knowing if, if – and I moved my wife, who's a, an Alberta girl. You know, she came willingly, but this is not the life she dreamed of. And we created something down there, and I don't know how much longer we'll be there before we – we're back here, but I know that it's it'll always be there on a filthy sidewalk outside the Shake Shack to tell people that I came <laughs> and I did something and I and I and I, and I accomplished that. And I I said in my speech, I, I said to my son, you know, I hope one day you will bring your grandchildren here and they will look up at you and say, Granddad, now can we go to Universal? <laughs> Willingly, are you going to uh, come back to Canada? You, I, I couldn't help but notice you said that. Oh, yeah. Well, you think uh, you might I, make the move back up? Uh, I, I, I do. We, we built a place in Vancouver <clears throat> that was uh, always meant to be our retirement home or whatever. And um, and I've been able to live there and enjoy the home while, while we're shooting Travelers. And I just I, – I love it. I love being back in Toronto. I love Vancouver. Mm. And um, and I was at St. John's once too and I loved that. What were you there for? I did. I did. I was doing a play in New Brunswick. I was doing Saltwater Moon in New Brunswick, and I and it's in uh, Newfoundland mm -hmm. uh, sound. So I went and just lived there for a week. It was very method. This is, this is, this is years. This is like 1990, and uh, and I just hung out in St. John's and sat in pubs and listened to people. It was awesome. Uh, that's, that's kind of my life. Yeah. I'm, I'm in there <laughs> drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I was listening to you drink, <laughs> and uh, and copying you on stage in Frederick. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, is your star is your star too far away from the current U.S. presidents? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, it was dug up, wasn't it, a few times? I think a few times. Yeah. yeah. Maybe so. I mean, that's the problem with the whole star, the walk of fame thing, is that for everyone that you go, oh my God, look, mm -hmm. there's someone else you go, oh, oh Lordy, maybe I'll. <laughs> Step, try not to break my mother's back. <laughs> I know. Uh, nice to talk to you. Great to talk to you. Thanks for having me.